Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today I have a few questions. The first one is, what can counselors and non-counselors learn from Phil McGraw, the TV show host? So I'll answer this question by looking at 10 mistakes that Phil McGraw makes and what counselors can learn from them. The next question is, what is his therapeutic modality? So one of the questions I hear around this is, did Phil McGraw steal the work of Dr. Glasser? So is his modality similar to reality therapy? So just an important note here as I get started, Phil McGraw, of course, is a real person. So I'm not diagnosing anybody here in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. And another note here, I've never been a fan of Phil McGraw. So when I talk about him, like in situations like this, I'm attempting to be fair, but I just want to put that out there that I'm not a fan. So I want to start with some background and key points about Phil McGraw that I think will help frame the rest of this video. Phil McGraw has a successful TV show and YouTube channel featuring what I guess could be called consultations with people who have mental disorders and or behavior that deviates from social norms. Ostensibly, he is not conducting therapy in the course of his show, although he does offer advice during many of his shows. He references treatment modalities, he identifies problems, and he discusses psychopathology. He also says things like, I'm here to help you. That sure seems like therapy, but the story I guess here is that he's not delivering therapy. He says that he's teaching, so these are teaching moments on the show so people can learn from what he's doing. So of course that's a possibility, and I'll be talking about what he teaches today, but also I think he does raise awareness about some of the mental disorders that are highlighted on the show. Phil McGraw typically refers guests on the show to licensed mental health professionals, so even though they're on that show and not really too much good is happening there in my opinion, he is referring them to people who can help them. We see that he is a real doctor. This is a question I get sometimes. He does have a PhD in psychology and that qualifies him as a doctor. At one time he was licensed and then he had a dual relationship with a former client and this led to a letter of reprimand. He did not lose his license. He gave it up in 2006. He's also clearly intelligent and he appears to have superficial charm and I think both of these attributes help him to succeed. In terms of learning value, I see a lot of learning value from the point of view of clinicians and training and others trying to learn about therapy. From Phil McGraw, they can learn what not to do, right? And this has become kind of a popular thing that we see in training programs. We see people looking at a show and picking out all of the ethical problems. And sometimes it takes a while to get through them all. Unfortunately, learning works in both directions. People can learn good things and bad things from the show. And I've encountered situations where counselors in training have looked at the show and they believe that Phil McGraw in a certain situation was doing something helpful. So they thought they should behave like he behaves. Now, sometimes he was doing something helpful, but sometimes he wasn't. He's not a consistent example in terms of being helpful or harmful. It really depends on which episode somebody's looking at when they make that determination. So now looking at my list of 10 mistakes, if Phil McGraw was conducting therapy, if that is what he is doing, what are the 10 mistakes that he makes and what can clinicians and others interested in therapy learn from those mistakes? So getting started here with item number one, this is not being careful in front of an audience. Now this may not seem like a valid point. Most counselors would not have a studio audience because they're not on a show. But it's important to remember that in group counseling, or in family counseling, there is this sense that there could be an audience. A clinician has to be careful about what they say about a client or what they ask from a client when other people are watching. The second mistake, having a fascination with who is telling the truth. So finding out the truth when working as a counselor is certainly helpful, but counselors don't always have the ability to do that. We see Phil McGraw tends to use polygraph information. He says he's very familiar with them and there's a lot of science behind them. Well, yes, there is. The science indicates that polygraphs don't work very well, right? So it makes me wonder if he's actually reading the scientific literature about polygraphs. But either way, finding out the truth, again, is helpful, but you really can't have a fascination with it because sometimes you can never get to the truth. You still have to be able to help people even if you can't find out for sure 
what's going on or what happened in the past. Mistake number three, not being able to separate your skills and interests from your work as a counselor. So part of Phil McGraw's career was spent as a consultant for legal related matters. Many times on his show, he kind of appears like a judge or a lawyer, and he discusses how much experience he has in all of these areas. I mentioned his fascination with finding the truth, but also his style has this cross-examination feel to it, like he's trying to get people to admit something against interest. It's not always a counselor's job to get clients to incriminate themselves, right? And I don't really see that as part of their job at all. We see that Phil McGraw does that quite a bit. Mistake number four, using canned witty statements. We see Phil McGraw tends to use the same canned statements over and over inside of a particular episode and sometimes across episodes, like you need to be your own best friend. Again, we see really little depth, no reading of scientific literature, which I guess makes sense from his point of view, but it's disappointing because it seems like he can't adapt to a situation that's changing. The lack of depth of knowledge we see on a particular subject is not apparent in the short time frame of an episode. He seems well prepared for the short burst type style that a show has, right? So he's talking to somebody for five minutes. He can do okay then. But again, we see kind of a lack of depth, the inability to really go into deep water. He can't handle being challenged by guests. He can't handle twists and turns that may come up, like unexpected directions in the conversation. We see that when something surprising happens, he kind of sits there and doesn't always have something definitive to say. He seems to be taken off guard. Another challenge I have here is it looks like he wants to say something during those moments when he's caught off guard. It never seems to occur to him that he could just keep listening, right? So his show really isn't about listening. It's about him talking. Another point here with the same item, it's important to resist the desire to try to fix someone else's problem immediately. There may come a time for direct advice in counseling, but that's usually not within the first 30 minutes of talking to a new client. Mistake number five, always being and playing the expert. Someone called him an expert in a recent episode and he said, that's exactly right, I am. Now, it's good to be an expert. However, if you really are an expert, you don't have to brag about it constantly in a session or even brag about it at all. I'm not exactly sure Phil McGraw is an expert in many of the areas that he covers on the show. We see this one episode where Phil McGraw was talking with a 45-year-old man who lived at home. The man had been an aircraft mechanic. This led to Phil McGraw talking about how he had all this experience flying these different types of aircrafts. He really understood aviation so well. These experiences really had no value in this particular context. It's like he couldn't resist talking about himself in that moment, even though it didn't help his guest at all. Mistake number six, using terms in mental health as if they don't have meaning or using the wrong terms. For example, we see this episode where there was a woman who appeared to be delusional. She appeared to have what's called an idea of reference. She saw an Instagram photo featuring Phil McGraw wearing a hat, and she believed his wearing of that hat indicated that the mafia knew about her upcoming appearance on his show. Phil McGraw initially referred to her behavior as emotional confusion. That's not even close to what was going on. Then he used this term flight of ideas. Now that's actually closer and she did have a little bit of that going on. But again, these words from mental health counseling research actually have precise meanings. There's definitions for these terms. Mental health clinicians just don't throw them around randomly. They try to select the correct term. Now it's interesting in that same episode when talking to that woman who appeared to have the delusions, he told her that she wasn't that important. He said, you're just not that important. And you need to stop talking. So could Phil McGraw have been projecting by using these two statements? Something that occurred to me, right? Because you look at those two statements and you think, those apply to more than just that guest. I actually think that they really didn't apply to that guest at all, right? I mean, telling her she wasn't important, that's not helpful. And being rude and telling her to stop talking. I can understand there might be a desire to have her stop talking. It is a show. So there has to be some sort of structure. But there's no reason to be impolite. In another video dealing with a 21-year-old female who sent hundreds of texts to a woman she met online, the guest describes what clearly appears to be ideas of reference. And in that episode as well, Phil McGraw completely misses it. 
Now moving to mistake number seven. This is taking pride in spotting delusional behavior. Many of the episodes we see with Dr. Phil here involve this particular theme. We see reactions from the audience trying to figure out what a person was thinking when they make certain statements. He kind of highlights the oddity of delusional thinking. Phil McGraw seems fascinated that anyone could have a delusion. It's like each time he sees someone who's delusional, it's the first time he's ever seen someone like that. It's like he wants a reward for seeing something's clearly delusional and pointing it out, right? It's just kind of an odd behavior. Also, trying to point out the logic of why somebody's delusion is, in fact, delusional has limited value. If simply pointing out irrational behavior eradicated the behavior, the people would already be better, right? So I don't really see the value in this, what he's doing here, unless he's just trying to humiliate and embarrass that guest. I don't know. I don't really see any other purpose for it. Moving to mistake number eight. Failing to understand the complexity of relationships and how those relationships evolve over time. So in this one episode, we see this discussion between a husband and a wife where the husband has a secret. Phil McGraw says, I'm not going to tell your secrets, but you've told us things backstage that you have not told your wife. Then he says, come clean about everything with your wife or decide to go your own way. Trying to hold the guest accountable. He threatens to end the discussion. Right, So Phil McGraw is threatening to just end that segment if the guy doesn't share the secrets. Sort of like terminating a session or terminating treatment. It's almost like Phil McGraw is saying, I'm going to threaten you until I get a result that I want. There's nothing therapeutic about that. Mistake number nine, taking sides. So we see this frequently in the Dr. Phil show. It's easy to fall into this, and of course it's not helpful. I get the sense that Phil McGraw decides in advance who he is going to side with and who he's going to highlight as the one having the problem. That probably helps him to prepare in what limited research he does before the show. So he has this image in his mind of how things are going to play out. And I talked about this before. It's like he's not good at adapting on his feet. He's not good at reacting when that situation tends to change. Sometimes the people that he's kind of committed to agreeing with say awful things, right? The narrative seems to shift, and he kind of sticks with the original story, again, that I think he must plan out in advance. Of course, I don't know that for sure. It's just the sense I get from watching many episodes of that show. So mistake number 10, the last one I'll cover here, is manipulating clients, or in the case of Phil McGraw, manipulating guests. Outside of the obvious ethical problems, it's not effective. And really, this manipulation piece kind of ties to a lot of the other mistakes I've talked about here. So now moving on to the other question. Of course, keeping in mind that Phil McGraw says that what he does is not therapy. What therapeutic modality does he seem to be using? What's the closest modality to what he's actually doing? Some have suggested that Phil McGraw took the ideas of a theorist named William Glasser, the individual who developed reality therapy. So let's take a look at that. I think this idea that he took reality therapy, that Phil McGraw took it and made it his own, comes from his phrase, get real. That's actually pretty much the extent of his usage of that modality. Reality therapy essentially says that there are no mental disorders. William Glasser said the DSM was the worst book ever created. Instead, with reality therapy, we see that all dysfunction is simply a result of the human condition, having unmet needs, and not being able to control the effort to meet those needs. Control is actually a major theme of reality therapy, and this will come up again a little bit later in this video. The role of the therapist in reality therapy is to be non-judgmental and non-coercive, different than what we see from Phil McGraw. There is no blame or criticism, again different. Symptoms are typically not discussed, that's quite different. And there's a focus on the present. We really don't see a history being taken. The past isn't talked about. So that's also different. A lot of these elements are actually quite different from what Phil McGraw does. Now, I'm not a big fan of reality therapy. It certainly has some good points, but the failure to look at somebody's history really misses a lot, right? So just as a side note, I'm not a fan of that particular therapy either. So it kind of seems to be a theme of this video. So if Phil McGraw is not using reality therapy, what counseling modality would be the most similar to what he's doing? His strategy really doesn't line up with any modality, but I have a theory, a made-up modality, that I think his behavior does align with. And before I get into that, 
Let's look at the strategies that he does seem to use as part of this made-up modality. We see humiliating guests, right? So embarrassing them, over-talking them, dominating guests, wowing them with star power and his incredible levels of knowledge about almost everything, intimidation, and using canned, witty remarks. There's actually many other things I could talk about here, but this is enough, I think, to demonstrate my point. What's the theme of all this behavior? Well, in a sense, it goes back to that one part of reality therapy I talked about before, control. Rather than simply trying to have control over meeting one's needs, Phil McGraw's control theory seems to be Phil McGraw is having control, right? So that's his version of a control theory. I talked before about how sometimes he only seems to have an impression of constructs that we see in mental health counseling, right? Like the ideas of reference. Like he talks about it without using the correct term and really doesn't seem to understand what's going on. Perhaps he heard the word control from reality therapy and just thought, that means I'm taking control. I don't know. It's impossible to know what his motives are or what he's thinking. But kind of looking at what he does, I think that some sort of control theory makes the most sense. Now, again, what he's doing really isn't therapy in the sense that it's not helpful. Like if it's intended to be therapeutic, it's certainly not. Control theory is not a valid theory because trying to control clients isn't helpful. Now, that doesn't mean that clinicians don't do this sometimes. And again, this is one of the things I worry about when especially counselors in training are looking at Phil McGraw and thinking, I need to emulate this behavior. That's certainly not the way I think about it. I think we can really look at Phil McGraw instead and say, I'm kind of learning what not to do. As I talked about before, I think that's really one of the greatest lessons that Phil McGraw can teach us. Now, I know whenever I talk about topics like celebrity personalities, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.